and I want to welcome Rick Forrest and Vic Dorch Knight as they present Spring Birding with the Bird Guys. As you know, if you've uh, seen them before, they have been here and they're the Bird Guys. So they're going to start right now and I'll come back during the uh, Q&A and um, you guys can start the program. Thank you and good evening, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. We're always excited to uh, talk about birds with anybody who's willing to listen. Um, so tonight, uh, well, first off, uh, I'm Rick Forrest. Um, I'm a retired science teacher now. I do a little bit of part-time teaching at Open, but uh, uh, wanted to spend more and more of my time uh, taking pictures of birds and birding. And Vic, uh, we have known each other since seventh grade. And uh, earlier, somebody asked us, you know, how long have you been birding? We've each been birding just about 45 years and they said oh so that's 90 years of combined birding and that made me feel a little bit old so <laughs> but uh, uh vic you want to tell them about yourself as well sure um like rick said uh we go back to the seventh grade and um rick studied uh, biology in college uh for his undergraduate degree and during that time he did some uh, field study work up on beaver island and myself and a couple friends of ours uh, came up to visit and uh, we kind of got involved in what Rick was observing and what we he was doing and we kind of found it fascinating and so we all kind of picked it up as a hobby at the same time and it's been a great social outlet for us uh, we kind of get together every this time every spring kind of like uh, a lot of guys do in the fall for deer hunting it's just that we go hunting for birds and we don't shoot them with guns we shoot them with cameras so that's kind of what we do and we have fun at it and hopefully uh, you guys can enjoy some of this and learn a, a few things. So what we're going to talk to you about tonight is first off why birding. Um, I mean we're going to talk about spring birding a lot as the program says but we're going to also give a little bit of introduction to birding for some of you that maybe haven't uh, gotten into this uh, yet and so uh, you know why, why is it that this is such a popular thing to do? Well, first off, birds are very colorful. I mean, I, not too many of them are ugly. I mean, <laughs> so, and then, then the other thing is, is that uh, they add a lot of nice uh, aesthetic sounds around the yard when you have them around. Here's an example. And that's the bird on the upper left in this, in this slide. We're gonna talk about that bird a little bit later on, but Besides being beautiful and having beautiful songs, they're entertaining. And the best part is that you can do this hobby anywhere, anytime. We both, we both have binoculars in our cars <laughs> just about all the time. And so what do you need to get started? Well, you only really need two things to get started. Something to help you identify the bird, such as a, and this is old school here, a field guide. Um, nowadays, more people are using apps on their smartphones. And then you need something to help you get closer to the birds, get closer view. So that's going to involve a pair of binoculars. Of course, you can see them without binoculars, but it's nice to have binoculars, particularly if you're away from your home and you're somewhere else. You know, like if you're bird feeding, obviously you get a pretty good view. So as Maggie mentioned that, that there is a handout that we kind of prepared that has some suggestions for field guides if you want to still go with a print, uh, printed, you know, hard copy field guide, as well as um, different birding apps. So, and these slides had a few examples. Uh, you know, one of the first field guides ever published was the Peterson Field Guide from Roger Torrey Peterson, published in like 1934. And he's kind of credited with popularizing, uh, you know, bird watching. So you want to add anything about the apps? Uh, we, uh, there's a, a nice one called, uh, uh, well, the Peterson one that's pictured here. Uh, I'm not sure that one's still available uh, as far as an app, but uh, iBird Pro is what we both use. And there's another nice one called Merlin Bird ID, yeah. which is free. And that's on the bird's another good one. Also, if you're going to be, um, you know, purchasing a pair of binoculars, we thought we'd spend a couple of a uh, couple of moments and talk about that. Um, you know, traditionally years ago, everybody had what they call um, a poro prism 
uh, design, which is kind of on the right here. And those are kind of what binoculars for years and years were made that way. And then manufacturers started finding ways to make them a little more compact with a roof prism design. And that you see in the upper left versus the upper right. So nowadays, I think most birders probably use the roof prism design, although you can still get poral prism binoculars and they still have excellent optics. All right. Usually your binoculars are uh, identified with two different numbers. Uh, the first number that you're going to run into is the magnification factor. And the second number is the objective diameter. In other words, that would be the lens that's closest to the object you're looking at, the big one at the end of the binocular. So like the example says, an eight by 42 means that you're going to get eight times of magnification. It's going to look like it's eight times closer than where you're standing. And the 42 millimeter is the diameter of the objective lens, which allows the bigger the objective lens, the more light that you'll get in and the better the binoculars will be in low light situations. And eight by 42 is kind of the sweet spot for birding. If you get too much magnification, they tend to get a little shaky and harder to find the birds in the binoculars. Although a lot of people do use 10 by 42. Um, and then 42 seems to be a good size, uh, a good uh, blend between letting enough light through and not being overly uh, bulky in size. It's good to have a size reference. If you were to go out and look at a bird and then describe it to somebody, um, one of the first things, you know, if you were maybe describing it to somebody who's done a little bit of birding, they'll say, well, what, how big was it? And birders tend to use a size reference as being a crow size, robin size, or sparrow size. Now, of course, a lot of the birds are warbler size, <laughs> as we're going to talk about today, and that, that's a, even smaller than the sparrow. All right. As we talked about before, when identifying birds, the first thing you want to do is look at the appearance. And of course, when you look at this bird, it's pretty uh, evident right from the start that the coloration is different. So you see a bird that's got a blue back like this and a rust colored breast. And if you went to your field guide or if you're somewhat familiar with birds, you would find out that this is an Eastern bluebird. So sometimes just describing the appearance, you can't miss, you know, there's not too many birds that are going to be this kind of coloration. But other birds, like this one, have other species that are extremely similar to it. And so it's helpful to, to be able to hear the bird if you're lucky enough to hear it. And this one happens to be named after its sound, its call. So let's listen to that. So this is an Eastern wood peewee, <laughs> and you can hear the peewee, and so it's named after the sound. So if you can, you know, if you hear that and you describe it to somebody, well, then, you know, they, they, that sounded like a peewee, you know. Very distinctive. Again, uh, such as this, you look at this bird and we're gonna talk about habitat. So anybody that's familiar with being around a marsh or wetlands, you're gonna look at that bird and you're gonna say, gee, it looks like he's sitting on a cattail. So that would probably be a bird that would be found in the swamp or in a marsh. And of course, what is this guy? A marsh wren. And much like the other wrens, uh, he has the same habit of sticking that tail up in the air. And he's got the uh, long skinny beak that are, is used for eating uh, and probing for insects. So again, you see a bird, you want to kind of take note of where it's at, because that's a pretty good clue as to narrowing it down as to what it could be. And then lastly, you want to take a look at bird behavior, because some birds have a particular mannerism about them. And this is, you kind of take a look at this video. Now watch this bird, what it does with its tail. You'll see it kind of pumping its tail 
flitting its tail up and down. You see that right there. And that's kind of a giveaway as to what this bird is. That's This is a, a palm warbler. Um, and they have that characteristic tail pumping. There's a few other species that do, but uh, that's one of the few warblers that do. Right. And then of course, if you have a, a field guide or an app, you can always check the range of the bird to see if that's something that is likely. Um, and if you're trying to figure out what the bird is, you can look at the range map and see the time of year that you're seeing it, if that's a likely candidate. This is a bay-breasted warbler and um, took this picture um, in May, uh, two years ago, 2019. And most of the warblers in Michigan are my, the ones that migrate through come through in May. So now you look at the range map and it's yellow during the mic. The range map shows the migration coverage as being yellow. And so this, this perfectly fit. Here's the sound. A lot of warblers have that kind of a weaker sound sounding call. All right. So, yeah. Go I'll, I'll take this one. When to go birding? Well, your best time is really any time, but uh, the ultimate times are to go during migration periods. And here in Michigan, we have two, two times where migrations occur in large numbers, and that would be in spring and then in the fall. And as you can see from the drawing here, the inset, that Michigan really lies in the middle or the crossroads of two what we call flyways. On the map, you'll see the blue off to the right that goes up the uh, eastern shores of the United States and we would call that the Atlantic Flyway. And then the green area that you see that comes up from South Florida and Cuba and then follows the Mississippi River would be called the Mississippi Flyway. And here in Southeast Michigan, we're very fortunate in this part of Ohio, Michigan, in Ontario, where we have a conflux of these two flyways. And so in the springtime, we get a large, large number of birds that come through. So really the month of May is ideal for this area. You can see more birds in May um, than I think any other month of the year in Michigan. And they do follow these flyways. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that they, they don't just fly anywhere. They kind of follow these routes. So one of the places I always recommend you start is your backyard. Um, and this was one that was in my backyard last year. And I get excited when I see, this is a red-winged blackbird, which is very common, but they arrive around the 1st of March, typically. And you might hear them before you see them. And after a long winter, that's just a welcome sound because it means spring isn't very far away. Time to get out the cameras. This is another one that uh, we have kind of a wet area back behind where I live. And uh, this is a warbler, but it's called a common yellow throat for obvious reasons. And they have a really cool call and again, you know, if you read something like the Peterson Field Guide, he always has words to describe the call. So he describes this one as witchety, witchety, witchety. See if we can hear that. It fits. And maybe, okay. So the uh, warblers are mostly, uh, you know, maybe four and a half inches in size. They're a little smaller than the, the sparrows. And so you kind of have to look for them because you know they're active, they're moving around. Common yellow throat. There's another one that's yellow, and he's yellow all over. And of course, that's a yellow warbler. And this is one of the more common warblers, and they'll actually stay around the rest of the summer. A lot of the warblers that we see in May are migrating through to areas further north for nesting. And this is one that will nest uh, in our part of the, uh, in our area here in Southeast Michigan. So that's a yellow warbler and it's all yellow. You know, you can, some people might say, well, it looks like a goldfinch, but a 
Goldfinch has more of a conical bill. They have black wings and a black cap, and they're slightly bigger than this bird. It's another warbler. It looks big in this picture, but it's another small bird. This is a black Bernian warbler. Again, this was behind my house. And most people are going to have these birds in and around the shrubs around their house this time of year. You're not going to just see them, you know, if you don't look carefully for them. So you got to get out and look at the shrubbery and look at the trees and just look for movement. I have an, a mature oak tree in the yard and they come to that every spring. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt the audio. <laughs> Blackberry and warbler. As I was birding with my brother one time and we saw one and later on he goes, what was that bird that looked like the custom flames on a hood of a you know hot rod car? <laughs> and that was this bird. So. That's what he looks like. <laughs> All right, now if you were gonna be looking at this bird in the field, uh, the first thing you want to do is look for what we call striking field marks. And of course, the thing that stands out in this bird is that uh, reddish color stripe on the side. And if we were to say that that's kind of a chestnut color, we would call this guy the chestnut sided warbler. Again, every one of these in our backyard last year. And this is, everybody pretty much knows what this bird is, um, the American robin, and it's what we think of when we think of a migrating bird, although it's about 20% of them, 20 to 25% of them will overwinter. So you may see some of these in the winter as well. But we happen to have a, a shrub called a service berry uh, outside our house, and uh, it produces white flowers and then Right around well, a few weeks ago, it was in bloom. And so now the berries are starting to swell up and ripen. And when they ripen, the robins are going to move in and strip it clean in a matter of about two to three days because they just love these berries and cedar wax wings as well, which we'll have a slide up later. By they the way, were disgorging themselves. This is also the state bird of Michigan. And this is also, you know, when they start singing, Another nice sign of spring. Except at 4.30 in the morning. Which they will do if they're nesting near your window. This is outside my neighbor's house, right by his patio. I don't know if they're waiting for the party to start or what, but these are a couple of sandhill cranes. And uh, they typically, you know, they, they sometimes walk around people's neighborhood and sometimes they have young ones with them. I particularly like their call. Just as a quick aside, when Rick and I first started birding many, many years ago, these birds were not common in Michigan at all. And this is a bird that's had, had a large increase in population in the state and has adapted well. This is an Eastern Kingbird and it's another uh, flycatcher. Um, you recall earlier, I showed you a slide of uh, Eastern Wood Peewee and we talked about the call of the Peewee. And this is a bird in that family of called flycatchers. And the reason they're called flycatchers their behavior, they'll, they'll perch like this bird is. They'll fly away from the perch, maybe uh, three or four feet away from the perch, snap an insect out of the air and fly right back to the perch, right where they were. But Eastern Kingbirds, uh, it's one of the larger flycatchers, has that white uh, kind of a stripe along the, the tail, kind of, kind of gives it away. So when I mentioned the berries that the uh, American robins were eating earlier, um, this isn't a migrant per se, but they get pretty active in the spring and, and it's when you might notice them around because 
some of the leftover berries that had been there kind of most of the winter, these birds will move in and, and start eating them in a hurry. Um, this is a cedar waxwing. Um, there's, I've got the, the, the foreground one in focus. There's one that's slightly blurred behind here, but you can see the, the red on the wing. It looks like it's been dipped in, in, in sealing wax, you know. And uh, so they, we had, a, this was a uh, cranberry viburnum right outside our kitchen window. I just kind of leaned over the sink and took this picture. And they were, they stripped this, this shrub clean of these berries in about two days. There's kind of a weak call, squeaky call that they have. Very thin, very thin sounding. Oh, one of your little brown jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, quite a few species of what we call native sparrows, but a lot of people that when they think of sparrow, um, what they might typically see is a house sparrow or sometimes called English sparrow. But those are not native. They were introduced to North America in the 1860s. Man came to Central Park and opened up a cage full of house sparrows and starlings. <laughs> and now they've spread across the entire North American continent. However, this is one of our native sparrows, and this is a song sparrow. And the field mark to look for here is that central black spot. Here's what they sound like. So another nice, uh, you know, bird that's welcoming in spring. Now this time of year is particularly exciting because you can start a lot of birds that feed on uh, nectar or um, sweet things start coming through and that would include the Orioles. And this is a type of an Oriole, it is not a Baltimore Oriole. I had this at my feeder several years ago and um, this happens to be an orchard Oriole. And it's that first year male orchard Oriole. They actually, as they become an adult, get a brick red color on them. Not, not orange like the Baltimore, but a brick red color. I don't have a, a slide of the adult, but this was a first year. Here's what they sound like. Very beautiful. So and the orchard Orioles are a little less common, so it's pretty exciting to get one you know, at the feeder. Now here's the Baltimore Oriole, and these are pretty common, and they're, they're here right now. They've been here, I, I had my first one, I think Saturday this past week, uh, visit, visit the feeder. And they love grape jelly. That's what this one's, this guy's eating right here. He's eating some grape jelly. And you also see the house finch on the left enjoying the grape jelly as well. And of course, the other thing they like are oranges. So you can slice a, you know, an orange half and put it out there. And they really like that too. Yeah, the one I had Sunday, that's what he went for first thing. Went for the orange. You know, one of the, in the first slide, we said one of the reasons you like to do birding is they're entertaining. <laughs> this is an Oriole that was trying to get the nectar out of a hummingbird feeder. And it was hanging off is one of the upside. It was really meant for the hummingbird to come in and just hover and, you know, and put its long bill in there to get the nectar, the sugar water. Um, but, uh, you know, this guy was managing to get some of it. Here's what the Orioles sound like. A beautiful sound to have in your yard. What sent me running outside on Sunday. <laughs> it's a great little shot here. Uh, this was from a feeding station up at Tawas. And you can see that just on a small platform like this, you can have a, a hopper feeder and a suet block attached to the side and an orange laying up there. And you've got three different varieties of birds right now. You've got the Oriole on the right, you have a red-bellied woodpecker pecking at the suet, 
and you've got the blue jay going for the seeds that are being uh, distributed out of that hopper feeder. And the point is, is they're all selecting a different food here. So the, the, the key to getting a good variety of birds is to offer, if you're bird feeding, is to offer uh, you know, a good variety of things for, for birds to eat. And the other nectar feeder that's so much fun to, and so entertaining <laughs> is the hummingbird. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird. It's the only established species east of the Mississippi. You sometimes see other species that are kind of out of range sometimes, but this is the common one that you might see in Michigan. The ruby on the throat, you have to see that in the correct lighting because there's actually no red pigment to give it that color. It is coming from the structure of the feathers. It is the way that the feathers are structured and the way the light waves interact with those feathers that some of those frequencies are absorbed and some are reflected. So you have to see it in the right light. But hummingbirds, it's a four to one uh, sugar water to uh, sh uh, water to sugar solution. Yeah, we tend to like to boil our water before we make the solution because it helps keep the uh, uh, solution uh, from going stale or going off a little bit longer than if you were to just use plain tap water without heating the mixture. So I would recommend that you bring your water to a boil, put your sugar in, mix it up real good, then throw it in a jar and keep it in the refrigerator and try yeah. and maintain it, what, about once a week? During hot days, maybe th every three days? Yeah, if it's warm out, you'll see it clouding up and that's when you wanna change it. But, you know, I make up about eight cups and I keep it in a quart kind of a container uh, in the refrigerator so that I don't have to, if, if it needs filling, you know, I can kind of clean out the feeder and fill it and I don't have to make, make the solution each time. Here's a guy that was in our backyard uh, just this weekend. This is uh, another spring migrant that comes through every year. And it's very distinctive if you look at that bill uh, and look at the size seed that he's trying to crack. This is what they would call a rose-breasted grosbeak. And these guys are seed eaters. And here's what they sound like. Another beautiful song. Very similar to a robin, but a little bit different. Now the male is very striking with the three colors. The female is kind of a, kind of almost looks like a female red-winged blackbird. The female, yeah, that's right. The female is just brown and striped because you remember that most birds, the female has nesting duties. You don't want the female, you know, to you know, stand out to predators and that. So the males tend to be showy, but sometimes uh, it's, it's sometimes, you know, there are exceptions to that as well. Another way to get birds into your yard is to put up some type of structure to attract, uh, you know, the nest for, for birds that nest in cavities, you can put up a bird house. This is a house wren and, um, you know, they're insect eaters. So they're just about, you know, they're just arriving like right now. I think there's a, there's, we heard one this morning actually. Mm -hmm. um, so they're here uh, and they're gonna be looking for net places to nest. And they're insect eaters or they're soft bodied uh, invertebrates. Uh, this, this guy's got a couple of youngsters in the nest there. He's ready, or he or she is ready to feed. Familiar sound around a lot of people's yards. Another good thing to attract birds is bird baths. I mean, I, I get more, this is, it looks like a winter shot. It was like mid-March, so getting towards spring, but, uh, uh, and this robin was enjoying a drink of water, but I, I see as many birds on the bird bath, you know, getting the, a drink of water as I do on the feeder sometimes. I mean, it's, I think it's just as important to, you can get birds to the bird bath that you might not get to the feeder. And so this is a robin. Most birds use the uh, bird bath in this manner. This is, happens to be a heated bird bath that you plug in. 
uh, and it doesn't freeze in the wintertime, which the birds just love that. Most birds use it like this. The morning doves around my house, for whatever reason, use like use the bird bath like this one. <laughs> and so, you know, it is important to keep them clean. You got to kind of clean them out. Uh, you know, you put put fresh water in every, you know, every couple of days or so. This is a picture that uh, I took not too far from downtown Rochester. This is a uh, breeding pair of great blue herons. And you can see the guy on the right has got a little stick that he's bringing back to the nest to help line it so that the female who's standing up above there will have room to settle in and lay her eggs. And herons are usually early returners in the spring. Uh, these guys came back to this area probably around, oh, the first week in March. And shortly thereafter, once the ice is off the ponds and they're able to start getting food, they're down in the woods collecting sticks and building these nests. And they tend to be, uh, uh, I guess you would call it, uh, well, they're colony nesters. So this is a, a, a colony of herons is actually called a rookery. And as you can see here, there's probably five or six different nests and both the male and female uh, stand over the nest and kind of supervise the uh, uh, deployment of these things. It's, an interesting it's quite shape. a sight to see a heron rookery. So now I'll show you a few slides that we've taken in other areas. Um, and one of our favorite places is Taos Point. Uh, it's a Taos Point State Park. And, you know, we showed you the flyway pictures earlier. The birds you know, the Mississippi Flyway and the Atlantic Flyway kind of come together right down there in Northern Ohio. And then the birds kind of follow that East shore, of, a lot of them anyway, will follow that East shore all the way up. And so, um, you know, they'll, they'll kind of cross the thumb area there. And then because Taos Point's kind of sticking out, they'll kind of funnel toward that point. And you can get just tremendous concentrations of migrant birds, particularly, you know, between let's say May 10th and May 20th. It's just an excellent, excellent time to be there to see a lot of the migrants. Here's one of our favorites. This was uh, a Taos, uh, 2019, I think, that took this shot. Um, this is a scarlet tanager. Here's the, we, we showed you this at the opening slide, and I think I played the sound. Here it is one more time. And honestly, as red as the bird looks in this picture, even this picture doesn't do it justice. When you see this bird, it looks like there's a light bulb inside of them. They're just so bright, so brilliantly red. Another favorite. This is an indigo bunting. And this is another one of those birds that has no, this, this bird has no blue pigment on it. Um, blue is actually a color that's, that's uh, you know, there's the pigment, a pigment blue is actually very rare in nature. So most uh, animals that have blue color on them, particularly birds, it's because of the structural interaction of light with the feathers. This is, this bird, uh, sometimes the call has been described as being 112233, listen for it. The male looks like a sparrow. It's brown and streaked. So you might say, well, how are you going to distinguish it from a sparrow? One of the keys is if you look at the bird's bill, the lower mandible, the lower part of its bill is white and the upper part is a dark color. The female will be the same way. So when you look at, you see the, the you know, the brown streaked female, you see that white lower mandible. That's kind of a giveaway that it's an indigo bunting. I've had these at the feeder. Yeah, they will, they will come to feeders. Warblers are perhaps the favorite thing for us to, to see. There's so, such a variety. There's probably over 30 species. 
that you can see in Michigan. This one is, is a uh, magnolia warbler. And here's what it sounds like. These birds are smaller than sparrows. Again, they're, most of these warblers are about maybe a four and a half inch body length. And you can see also their bill is very slender. They tend to be not seed eaters. Most of them are insect eaters. I mean, some of them might eat some, some forms of seed, but for the large part, they're insect eaters. This is an American red start. And uh, this is one of the warblers that, it is a type of warbler that will stay around in southeastern Michigan and nest in southeastern Michigan. Actually quite common around here. The female will be more of a brown instead of a black, and the parts that are kind of orangey red on this bird will be more yellowish on the female. But interesting is that the female has that same coloring pattern. It's, you know, the, the yellow is in the same places as the red is on this one. This is a black-throated blue warbler. Not a lot of color on this one. Kind of a weaker, typical warbler call. But not a lot of color because this one is called a black and white warbler. And Vic, you saw one already this year? Or yeah, we had one in the oak tree on Sunday and uh, photographs well with black and white film. <laughs> <laughs> so up at Tawas Point near, near Tawas um, is a, a marshy area called Tuttle Marsh. And it's kind of a wildlife area that has roads alongside of, you know, some dikes that are all marshy and, you know, you can kind of drive through this place and look for water birds on either side. Now we had, we've been birding a long time and it's been many years since we saw a rail. This is a, this is a rail called the Virginia rail. And uh, the, gee, that day that we saw this one, we saw probably four or five of them in the same day. Exactly. Here's the sound, here's the sound. We saw this one and then we saw a couple of them fly right over the vehicle. And that call is very distinctive. When you hear that, you pretty much know what you're looking for. Same thing with the Sora and a couple of the other marsh birds. Another real good hot spot is uh, on the northern edge of Ohio. You think of those flyways, you think of those birds flying north, and then they come to where they're going to cross Lake Erie. And we say, well, you know, why don't they just fly up the shore of Michigan? But it, they don't. They, they follow those flyways pretty closely. And so they'll pile up on the northern shore of Ohio and kind of fuel up before making that trek across Lake Erie. So again, this is one of those places where you just see tremendous concentrations. You can, you can walk up to a shrub and see six or seven species and not even needing binoculars. You know, you're like four feet from the shrub. It's pretty incredible. You see tremendous concentrations of humans too. Yes, yes. Uh, the, this uh, area has become so popular. There's a festival there called the Biggest Week in American Birding that they started about oh, five or six years ago. Oh, we know more than that, maybe 10 years ago now. Exactly. Um, and so at first, they, uh, the, the organizers went to the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the local Chamber of Commerce and they said, hey, you know, we want to start this birding festival. And we would like some, you know, you to supply some resources. Maybe can you get some shuttle buses and, you know, get some people, you know, some transportation to different parts of our festival and so on. And they were laughed at at first. Like the, the, the Chamber of Commerce, like, are you kidding? For a bunch of birders? Then they found out that lots of people came with really fat wallets. <laughs> and so now there's, you go down there now, and there's a big banner up across the town, welcome birders. And you know, it's, uh, it's pretty comical what happened. But it's gotten too crowded. It's uh, like shopping on Black Friday when you go there now. 
So here are a few slides from from that area, though. This is, and we saw one of these. This, this was this was in Oak Harbor, Ohio, yep. but we saw Vic and I saw one of these this morning. This is a blue gray gnat catcher, and we heard it before we saw it. One time we were at Taos and. Uh, the, the, the gnats were so thick, it was hard to breathe without inhaling some. And we're like, where are the blue-gray gnat catchers when we need them, right? And we couldn't find them. <laughs> this is a black-throated green warbler. And I showed you the black-throated blue a few slides back. And they're actually, they don't look alike, but their behavior is similar and their sound is similar. This is a Cape May warbler. Here's what it sounds like. Now, some of these warblers, you know, spring is the absolute best time to see them because they're in what we call nuptial plumage. They're, they're brighter colored in for spring um, you know, breeding than they would be other times of the year. So this is, this is that same, uh, you know, same bird. This is a black-throated green that you saw several slides back, but this is in the fall. And this is, you know, he's lost some of that. In fact, here I put a, a little uh, thumbnail in there for what that bird would look like in the spring. Yeah, the black throat is gone. So, and this one is, the, as I said, this was the bird, the, the uh, photograph on the left was in September at Erie Metro Park. So we've shown you a lot of migrants to look for in the spring, but some birds you're gonna see year round and you're still gonna see them in the spring. So, and this is a downy woodpecker, pretty familiar to a lot of people. Yep. Very popular Peter cool. bird. Around most neighborhoods, you'll find them. This particular shot was this past winter when we went out to Kensington. This is the red-bellied woodpecker. We showed him earlier um, actually eating suet. Uh, remember the, the slide we showed of the feeder that had the blue jay and the red-bellied and uh, the Oriole. The Oriole was eating an orange and the red belly was eating suet, but they do like oranges. They have a little bit of a sweet tooth. That's what they sound like. Another bird that's got a little bit of a sweet tooth and it's a resident bird, you can see it year round, is the house finch. And uh, so they'll eat oranges, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll eat grape jelly. Um, an interesting thing about the house finch is that this bird 40 years ago was not uh, in Michigan. Um, they, there's two species that are closely related. One is called the house finch, which is what this bird is. And one's called a purple finch. Purple finch, very similar, but more red coloring along the wing. Um, and, and you can tell them apart, uh, but they're very closely related. Yes. So their range just started expanding about 40 years ago. Um, and now they're very, very common throughout Michigan and all of the United States. But like you expressed this morning, the downside was we kind of did a flip-flop. One went up and the other one population went down. So the purple finch back in the 1970s was more common. And so now it's like the house finch kind of took over some of its niche. And uh, so the house finch is very common now. Purple finch is less so. Everybody's favorite, 
you always want to have these sound in the yard. It's probably the most popular bird you're going to see on a Christmas card. Exactly. We talked about behavior uh, early on in terms of uh, you know identifying a bird and nuthatches like to go head first down the trees. And just about the only bird that you're gonna see that go down head first. <laughs> and this is a white breasted nuthatch. This was during a kind of a heavy snow. I was visiting a friend up north and saw this going down his tree. Here's what they sound like. Very distinctive. So I think slightly smaller than that bird is this bird. Um, this is the red-breasted nuthatch. And they're very tame, they're very, they're very small, and they've got this nasal sounding call that I really like. I can practically walk up to my feeder with this guy on there, and it's not until I get ready to pull the seed out of the bag that he takes off. They're very tame. Yeah. Speaking of tame. <laughs> so chickadees, this was at Kensington Metro Park, and... Um, you know, the birds there have become very accustomed to people feeding them. In fact, we got out of the car. This was, uh, what, February or January? Yeah. I think it was, I think it was late January. So it, the three of us went there, Vic and I and another friend. And we got out of the car and Mike held his hand out with no seed in it. And a downy woodpecker came and landed on his hand without even any seed in it. We're like, are you kidding? <laughs> we went back to the car. I happened to have some um, Niger seed in the car. So then we started walking down the path and we were hand feeding the chickadees. This is another guy that comes to the backyards very often. I, I have a lot of blue jays in my backyard and they just love peanuts. So this is just one of the feeders I use. They'll uh, hunt and peck around there until they can pull one out of that spring. Again, it's entertainment. It's, it's entertainment value all the way. Now, sometimes, uh, you, know, you know, our theme tonight was a lot of spring birds, but couldn't help but, but show you this one because um, it, in, oh, for about three weeks during March, the first part of March, I had these visiting my feeder from, from, from further north. These birds actually nest in Northern Canada uh, and they'll wander down um, during years when, when their natural food supply is low. You know, they eat, they eat seeds from pine cones and, uh, you know, some years the, the seed crop is just lower than other years. And so in years when it's particularly low, they'll wander down. This is a common red pole. And it, it had them at the bird bath as well as the Niger feeder. Yeah, normally they won't come much below the UP. But this year during the big eruption, they were reporting those red poles as far south as uh, New Mexico. And this is a picture of a guy that I uh, took out there at the headwaters of the, uh, or excuse me, at the uh, drain waters there of the Clinton River going into Lake St. Clair. This is a snowy owl, another visitor that comes down from the Arctic Circle. And like Rick said, when their food supplies fail, they come south looking for food. And we've been very lucky the last four or five years because there's been uh, quite a number of regularly sighted snowy owls here in Michigan. Um, they are meat eaters and you can see the discoloration on this fella's breast. He just got through uh, dissecting a duck out by the lake there. And uh, these guys will come down early, sometimes in uh, end of November, and they'll stick around until, oh, end of February, early March, and then they head back up north.
Here's another one that I took a picture of right near where I took the picture of the snowy owl. And I found out about this guy through uh, one of those apps that we had talked about. And this is a mountain bluebird. And this was over in Mount Clemens. And Rick will show you on this map that they're not supposed to be here. <laughs> That's their ranger, they're a Western bird. And so, yeah, this, this, sometimes, you know, we see these, uh, we, we'll show you um, how you can get information on what's being cited at the end here. But, you know, you see the reports of these birds and like, are you kidding? <laughs> this is not supposed to be here at all. So that's why we call them accidentals. Birds that will show up that don't belong here, but either they get caught up in storm fronts or they get caught up in uh, mass migrations with other birds. And the next thing you know, they're here. And this was, this was an accidental. Also, this was a, a painted bunting. And uh, they're not supposed to be here either. This was up in Taos, actually, um, several years ago. And there's the painted bunnings range. So you can see them kind of like on the Carolina coast in Georgia and in Florida and, you know, t t t Texas, Oklahoma, that kind of thing. But uh, not Michigan, usually. <laughs> so this was quite a sighting. Yeah, this bird created a big stir up in Tawas a couple of years ago. So where can you find out what's being cited? Um, there is, if you go to a, a website called ebird.org, um, then you can sign up for um, the eBird alert. And it's just a Michigan Rare Bird Alert email that you'll get daily. And you can kind of look at it. And down below the list, you'll get a list like what looks like on the left here. And I blew up a couple of areas just so you could kind of read what's on there. But, um, you know, down below the list, they'll have where the birds were sighted. And you can click on it. And it'll actually go to like Google Maps or something and open up kind of where there'll be a pin where the bird was sighted. So, you know, that's why, you know, you hear reports of things like, you know, mountain bluebird or or, uh, you know, painted bunting, which we didn't see on eBird. Actually, somebody told us about that. But um, that's how you find out about some of those things. eBird.org. All right, now talk about finding rare birds. This is one. Uh, this guy showed up on the radar here in Michigan about a month ago, and <clears throat> it was on Good Friday. And I had to make a run down to uh, Morency, Michigan, if you know where that is. It's about two miles north of the Ohio border. And this is a whooping crane. It's similar to a sandhill crane, but about half again as large. And there's really only about 300 of these birds left in the wild. This was a bird that came very, very close to extinction. And if you look closely in the picture, you can see some green and red bands that are on the bird's legs. And these birds are tracked uh, meticulously throughout the breeding season and the migration period. One of the strategies that biologists use to try to increase their numbers is a foster parent program where they'll take one of their eggs. Because a lot of times, you know, if they have a two or three in a clutch, it, it's, it's often that one doesn't make it. And so they'll take one, which ensures a better chance of the one that's left, and put it with a sandhill crane set of parents <laughs> and to, you know, put that egg in, in a sandhill crane nest. And so, um, you know, they've, they've gotten some whooping cranes to survive to adulthood that way. And that's it. Thank you. Questions. You can open it up for questions. Okay. All right, um, let's look at the questions. Uh, we'll go into the chat first, and then there are some questions in the Q&A. Um, someone asked, do you have any hints about how to take such good photographs? Well, I'm going to speak for Rick on this one. And I would say that if there's interest, we could do a whole hour program on that. But yes, there's some good tips. Um, Go ahead, Rick. You can speak on this. I happen to have my camera right next to me, so I'll show it. Um, 
we shoot in a format called micro four thirds. It's, it, 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 you know, if you, if you see like a full size, like Canon EOS or Nikon, you know, full size um, digital SLRs, those take absolutely fantastic images, you know, great pictures. But to get a lens on one of those capable of shooting birds, you're going to spend between ten and fifteen thousand dollars because they're just gigantic. And so what we shoot is a format called Micro Four Thirds. And I don't know if you can see my my thumbnail picture up in the corner, but this is what they call a mirrorless camera. And this lens right here is a 100 to 400 zoom. And on this particular camera, which they have what they call a 2x crop factor, it makes this lens behave as though it was an 800 millimeter lens. So it is important that you have a, you know, maybe somewhere between five and 800 millimeters worth of, you know, telephoto lens um, to be able to get, to, you know, to be able to get close to most birds. Um, but we could, yeah, we could do a, we could do a, we could do a whole show on that one if, you, if there's interest. So. Yeah, and the number no, one. Another thing I wanted to mention is that um, the guys had given us a handout and I put that on the calendar uh, under May 4th under the birding presentation. So you can go to that after the presentation's over and it's by attachments. If you're on a computer, it's going to be the right of your screen. On, uh, for instance, I have an iPhone and when I looked on it on there, I had to scroll down where it said attachments and that has a lot of the information that um, they've been discussing. Go ahead, uh, Vic. Well, I was just gonna say that when you shoot with long lenses, like what Rick was showing, it's very, it's very important to make sure that you have good stability. Uh, you're either gonna be shooting at very high shutter speeds, which would require you to shoot, uh, to bump up your ASA or film speed, or make sure that you use a tripod, something that's very, very steady. Um, uh, someone asked, do robins eat worms instead of bird seed? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're adapted. You know, if you ever see a robin watching feet on the lawn, they can sense vibration with their feet. And, you know, the slightest movement of an earthworm under the grass, they can sense that. And they, they, you know, all of a sudden you'll see them pierce their bill into the uh, lawn and then come up with a worm. Like, how did they know it was there? You know, it's an unbelievable adapt adaptation. So yeah, they're, they feed mostly on soft body uh, invertebrates and fruit. You know, as I showed you earlier, the robins will eat fruit. And then um, someone asked, uh, can you recommend any specific feed to, uh, for birds to your feeder other than grape, jelly, and oranges? Um, and you, did you mention this is when you should be putting out the hummingbird feeders? about the path. So yeah, we talked about the hummingbird solution earlier, uh, you know, a four to one solution of uh, water to sugar. You want to get those out like right now. The hum I, I've had, I've, mine's up. I have not seen a hummingbird at it yet, but they're coming any day now. And you really want to have your feeders out before they arrive, because when they arrive is when they're kind of establishing their feeding routes. And so if you have your feeder out there when they get here, that'll be part of their route and they'll be there a lot. Now, as far as other types of seed, it does make a difference on quality. And we've done um, segments of our shows before where we've included um, bird feeding, but um, um, you know, there's low quality mixed feed at like say, some of the grocery stores, for example, where they put a lot of filler um, seed in called millet or milo. And you really wanna stick to like what the birds are really after, which is like sunflower seed, like um, there's striped sunflower, there's oiler, black oiler sunflower, um, there's hulled sunflower, which we've started using because it creates no mess. It seems expensive, but it's really um, not expensive when you start looking at how much they're going through in terms of the birds going through. Um, you know, better, better uh, mixed feed is gonna have some, uh, maybe safflower in it, uh, some cracked corn, uh, maybe some peanuts and things like that but a relatively low concentration of milo and millet. Um, you know, some of the, uh, like Costco, their, their feed's pretty good. Um, pretty good quality mixed feed. Um, so again, you wanna try to get a mixed feed that's got a lower amount of milo and millet. They'll all have some of that, but um, that's what we found. 
And then the other feed is Niger seed. Um, yes, N Y J E R. It's uh, black thistle seed. Uh, it looks like thistle. It's very. It's closely related to that, and you'll get a lot of finches feeding on the on the thistle seed. Another question: uh, How did you get those recordings? What kind of equipment did you use for your video? So those recordings after actually came. Most of those recordings are are from. Uh, Audubon.org uh, website, um, but you know we that is something that we're starting to do. We're starting to, to try to get some recordings of birds, but you know we don't have that many. Yet. But it is it's a it's uh, you know you just need you need a pretty good microphone and uh, the cameras that we're using uh, the video portion of it actually does a pretty good job of recording videos, uh, recording the audio as well. Um, someone asks, have you visited the Farmington Burb Observatory? Have, um, the, how does it compare? Observatory, sorry. I didn't know about it. I, I have not visited it. No, so I haven't either. I'd like but to look into that. Definitely, we would like to check it out. Mm -hmm. It's the Farmington uh -huh. Bird Observatory. Is that yeah, that's what they said. Okay. Uh, is McGee Marsh a good uh, bird watching place? Two thumbs up. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. It, McGee Marsh is in, in that Oak Harbor, Ohio area, part of that biggest week in American birding. And yeah, it's, a, it's a fabulous place to watch birds, particularly during this month. But um, in years past, when they've had that festival going on, it just gets very, very crowded. So that's just kind of the only word of caution that you have to expect a lot of people um, it, there. It, so. If you're going to go down that way, you're going to hit McGee, you want to hit Metzger, you want to hit the uh, uh, the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge there, and uh, the operation next door to it there. It's, it's all very good. Part of the Black Swamp. But, yeah, part of the Black Swamp Bird Observatory. Uh, someone mentioned uh, about the um, bird... Um in um, Farmington, it's, they said it's in the Farmington Nature Center. And then somebody says, are they talking about Heritage Park in Farmington? I'm not sure, but it's something that um, you guys could investigate. We will investigate it. It's, it's, it's good. Sounds yeah. like we got an assignment. So that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> well, one of my favorite birding activities in Farmington, if people don't know about it, is in the fall, at the old winery building on Grand River near, uh, I believe it's Nine Mile. Uh, every night in the fall, the um, chimney swifts come in by the thousands, if not tens of thousands into that old chimney. And it's it's usually a phenomenon that happens in the fall and it's something to behold. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, another um, comment and a question. Uh, she wants to know, my son wants to know if you've ever put grape jelly in the orange slice. Yes. It's absolutely something that you can do. I mean, I, I have a, a kind of a separate little tray for the grape jelly, but um, it's I've, I've sometimes people just kind of, when you get the grape jelly in one of those squirt uh, bottles that you get at the grocery store, and you can just squirt a little bit right on top of the, um, right on top of the orange. They'll, they'll enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Then here's another question. Is there a group or a university I can send a recorded bird call that I could not identify because I could not see the bird? Yes. Uh, I would recommend the uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. I'm sure that they would be able to help you. Yeah, I think that there's a website called All About Birds, which is sponsored by Cornell. And there's probably a contact form in there that uh, if you emailed them, they would tell you exactly where you could send such a recording. There's also an app called iNaturalist. Um, and there's, you know, there's some birding, there's some apps that will, if you, if you can capture the recording, um, you know, you can kind of put it through the app and, and sometimes you get an answer as to where it is. So. And then another question, why do birds call so early in the morning, sometimes 2.30 a.m.? <laughs> yeah, that's going to depend on the, on the, some species are, are, are active pretty early. That is true. Um, 
it just, you know, they're, it's a kind of a photo periodism. You know, they just, they see the, a hint of daylight now at 2.30. I don't know about that one, but like those robins, they'll start singing at 4.30 or so. And there's a little bit of daylight coming. They'll start right up. Um, there are other birds that, um, you know, might call through the night, you know. How, them, late, uh, uh, how late in the season will Orioles still eat oranges and grape jelly? I've heard that at some point they stop eating those and prefer bugs. Yeah, so when the natural food supply gets plentiful and they'll have to, you know, increase their protein take um, for their nesting, you know, for their, for their young. And, um, you know, the, the young that are in the nest, they'll have to feed them insects and that. So that's when they're going to be pretty busy collecting other food, food types uh, instead of, you know, pieces of orange or whatever. Uh, they'll be collecting other food types and taking them to the nest. That said, you, they'll come back. You can, you can have those oranges and, you know, grape jelly out a little bit later in the summer and you'll, you'll see them come back. I was going to say, once the uh, young have fledged, sometimes those birds will come right back to the feeder. They want to stock up on energy for the uh, uh, southward bound migration coming up in the fall. Okay, someone made a nice comment. Uh, my 13 year old loves birds. We enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Another okay. question, what sorts of large birds of prey can we expect to see in Michigan? I think I see hawks sometimes, uh, the occasional bald eagle, but I've never been positive when I see a large bird. Well, so the, the red-tailed hawk is the most common large hawk. You'll see them along the highway quite a bit. They feed on small rodents for the most part. Um, the immatures will be the good size hawk and they'll have kind of a white streaked breast with kind of a band going across here. And those are the um, ones that aren't fully adults yet. The full adults red-tailed hawks will have a red tail, <laughs> kind of a rusty red red colored tail. Very large hawk, um, the most common. Now some other other hawks that you might see are Cooper's hawk, which is a, a, their their favorite thing to eat are birds, smaller birds. In and, your uh, yard. <laughs> yeah, in your yard. And uh, those have, you know, the adults will have kind of a, a reddish colored breast, more of a gray back. Uh, but again, the immature is kind of a brown streak kind of thing. But yeah, they'll, uh, uh, there's another species that marked very similar to Cooper's hawk called the sharp shinned hawk, a little less common. Um, and those are smaller hawks. You want to speak about a few other species? Well, I was going to say that uh, if you're interested in raptors and hawks, uh, there's an excellent uh, festival in the fall in September down at Erie Metro Park. And of all things, it's called Hawk Fest. And it's not uncommon to go there on some days and see literally 5,000 hawks migrating through that park of various kinds, whether they're broad wing or, you know, red tailed or whatever. Uh, they get the biggest variety uh, in the largest concentration uh, on the southbound migration of hawks and raptors of any place I know around here. And so the, the uh, red-shouldered hawks, uh, broad-winged hawks, there's a number of other hawks you could see there. And they have people, they have people presenting uh, tips, giving tips on how to identify those hawks. And, you know, they'll, they'll, they've got little like uh, sheets with silhouettes of hawks on there and things like that that help you identify um, the hawks. And it's a pretty good program. I, I, I will say it's a hit or miss thing in terms of seeing the migration, migrating hawks. They'll have a certain date for hawk fest. And you might go down there on that certain date. It's usually a weekend, like a Saturday and Sunday kind of a thing. And you may not see hawks. It's, you might see, you know, like a flyover or something instead of the thousands that you might see. So it's kind it, of a it, hit or miss. Exactly. And it, you know, with the hawk migration, it's a much wider or more spread out time period. They'll start moving in September uh, for certain species. And then as you get later in the season, almost past, let's say Thanksgiving, you'll start seeing other birds like maybe, you know, golden eagles and things like that coming through. So it's, it's kind of a staged event. Where's the best place to see the bald eagle? Where, can, where should you go? Well, uh, I would say 
if you want to be guaranteed to see them, uh, down there at Sterling State Park near Monroe is a great spot because there's a Detroit Edison power plant there that provides plenty of warm water, especially in the cooler seasons. And the hawks just, or excuse me, the eagles just hang out in the trees there uh, waiting for fish to come to the surface and then they just swoop down and grab them. And Rick, I know we've been down that way a couple of times and we've been pretty lucky to see bald eagles down there. Bald eagles, their population has come back in recent years. Uh, you know, I mean, 30 years ago, they were, in, you know, fairly endangered, um, still from, you know, having dealt with pesticides in the 1970s and so on. But since those pesticides were banned, their population has come back pretty nicely. And, um, you know, there's certain known nests that you could you could visit. But usually there's one in, uh, what, Stony Creek? Uh, there's one on Belle Isle. Belle Isle, another place. So, um, yeah, I mean, you could, certain places where there's like known to be a nest, your chances are pretty good of, of seeing one. Okay, another person said they used to see a lot of goldfinches at the feeders, but haven't seen any in a couple of years. Where did they go? So they're still around, you know, in the winter time, they're not going to have the gold um, nuptial plumage. They'll be like that drab kind of olive color that the females are. But but I will say that um, it, what uh, you know, it depends on what you're feeding them. Um, they do like the niger seed, but that said, you got to keep it like you have to have good seed. Um, you know, some people think, well, seed is seed. It's never, you know, I'll be in my garage for years and that. The birds know the difference and seed can go bad. So you have to have good seed to be able to attract them. But um, wow. yeah, no, they should be around. So, you know, try some, uh, try some new Niger seed or something like that and you, you'll get them. Um, my my goldfish wanted... is like the hulled, uh, the hulled sunflower seed. Yeah, and so the whole, you can get what's called no mess um, or um, sunflower kernels, like Menard sells bags of sunflower kernels. I think it's like $27 for 20 pounds. Sounds expensive, but a 20 pound bag of sunflower kernels is has the same nutritional value of 70 pounds of Oilers that have the whole, you know, shells on them. So they go through the whole stuff slower because they're not, you know, opening them up and flinging these uh, husks everywhere. And the drop seeds won't germinate in your lawn. Right. Uh, could you repeat the body for the 100-400 lens that you mentioned earlier? So um, micro four thirds. Micro four thirds is the format. It's called a mirrorless because if you know, your, your full-size digital um, SLR cameras have a mirror in there and an optical viewfinder. So when you look in there, you're actually looking a reflection from a mirror that goes out through the lens. And when you take a picture on one of those cameras, the mirror has to flip up to let the light hit the sensor. These are called mirrorless, so they don't have an optical viewfinder because there's no mirror that flips up. This is an electronic viewfinder. And so you can look in there, you know, and see just like an optical viewfinder, but it's an electronic viewfinder. The yeah. advantage is if the camera body doesn't need to be as big um, to be able to do that. It's a, you know, a mirrorless design so they can make it more compact and therefore the lenses don't have to be as big and or as expensive. There's a number of companies that are doing mirrorless cameras, but the micro four thirds uh, format is really only produced by two companies, and that would be Panasonic Lumix and then Olympus. But yeah. there are other companies like Fuji and uh, Nikon and a few others that do offer mirrorless format. Yeah, Panasonic makes this brand called a Lumix. Um, and it's, uh, you know, basically, um, it doesn't say Panasonic anywhere on it, but it is made by Panasonic. But um, we shoot we shoot a Lumix Micro Four Thirds camera. That both of us have Lumix cameras. Okay. The next one is thank you for the presentation. Enjoyed the pictures and bird calls. Can you mention uh, some birding hot spots near Rochester and Troy area, like a one hour drive? Oh sure, we've got quite a few of them around here. Uh, Rick alluded previously to Stony Creek Metro Park, a very good spot to go birding. Um, 
the pictures that I had of the uh, herons are just north of town off of Parkdale Road uh, between DeQuinder and Letica, if you want to see the uh, heron colonies. Um, another great spot to go birding in the spring, believe it or not, is Belle Isle. And uh, they've got a couple of nice trails behind the uh, nature center there. And, you know, it's right out in the middle of the river. So it's part of that flyway area. It's a, it's a great spot. Yeah. And, you know, any almost all the metro parks are going to be pretty good because they all have pretty, pretty varied habitat and a pretty good extensive uh, network of trails. So the metro parks are all pretty good. Um, the county parks are pretty good, too. And you, you well, we, we talked about the uh, Troy or the uh, Lloyd Stage Nature Area there in uh, Troy on one of our previous talks, and that's a nice spot there. You've got uh, some flowing water going through there and some really good habitat. So, you know, we're in pretty good shape around here. Bloomer Park here in Rochester is another great place to go. Okay, here's a question. Uh, what color would a random feather be from a bird like a ruby-throated uh, hummingbird that don't actually have pigmented feathers? So what color is that? So the green part of the hummingbird is a pigmented, uh, I mean, you, you can find it'll look green, but but the, the, the ruby color on the throat, um, it might just look black. It'll, it'll, if you get in the right light, it'll still look red because it's, it's the way the light interacts with the feather. The same thing with the indigo bunting. You can find an indigo bunting feather or even a blue jay feather. Blue jays, that's a, still a structural thing. So you can, if you pick up a blue jay feather, it still looks blue to you. But if you don't look at it in the right light, like if you see, you know, just, you can just kind of play with it a little bit. And if it's in the wrong light, it'll look kind of dark, uh, either dark brown or black. Uh, a person asked a question about binoculars. Have you ever twisted your lenses on your binoculars and it they broke? It broke. Have you ever done that with your binoculars? Are you talking about like the um, the focus or the eyepiece? Mm, she says, have you ever twisted your lens on your binoculars and it broke? So there's, there's a couple things that she might mean there. Um, one of the things is, is eye relief on some of these Binoculars are twist up uh, pieces that twist up to, to give your eye some relief. And if those break, um, you know, that, that might be a little easier fix than let's say the focus wheel. Sometimes the focus wheel might be, you know, like one of the eyepieces might have a focus for um, the diopter adjustment. Um, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes, you know, you can repair it. And other times you might have to send it to the binocular manufacturer to fix. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to track cardinals to the feeders? What do they like? They love sunflower seed. They love safflower seed. So some of that premium uh, mix, like you might get at, at Costco or, you know, you can get good mixed feed at some of the, the granaries, you know, feed type stores. Um, yeah, cardinals, cardinals will be there. They love it. <laughs> Especially if you just stick with straight sunflower seed, and I would recommend the black oilers. And if you're going to mix anything, like Rick said, you might put the uh, safflower seed in there. If you start putting, you know, some of the grocery store variety seed in with it, it's a turnoff. Now, cardinals are, you know, larger birds, and so you need a, a feeder that can accommodate them. You have to have a feeder with perches that are, allow that size bird to be out there. Where did you mention the great blue heron rookery? Where was that again? That's on just, it's on Parkdale Road, north of the city of Rochester, and it would be between Letica Drive and DeQuinder. And it will be on the south side of Parkdale, just past the well, there's a building there that used to be the headquarters for French and Associates, but they're not in that building anymore. But you can't hardly miss it. You Someone asked. Right from, you can see it right from the road. Uh, how far can bufflehead ducks dive? Buffleheads. Yeah, bufflehead. Um, you know, they go pretty deep. I don't know. Uh, we. Uh, we used to, well, of course, you don't know that they're going to the bottom, but I've seen them dive uh, and be under for, you know, 
minute or so or longer. Um, and I, I would imagine that, that, you know, a 10 or 15 foot dive is probably not out of the realm for them. But I, I really don't know the answer to exactly how deep they can go for that. Yeah, so I don't we have know. two groups of ducks. We have ducks that dive for food and ducks that dabble for food. The dabble ducks, the dabblers, as we call them, are like your mallards, um, you know, uh, pintails. Uh, shovelers. Yeah, shovelers, uh, teal, those kind of ducks. They just tip. They kind of put their rear ends in the air, and then they just get stuff off where it's shallow. The diving ducks dive under like buffleheads, an example. And um, they'll, they'll, they'll be after other things that maybe fish or maybe maybe some things on the bottom. So. Yeah, generally your diving ducks are meat eaters or they go for clams, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, someone mentions Cornell's bird net site is, uh, works well for sound submissions. Okay. So, 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 yeah. For the people that had a, a sound that they couldn't identify. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have you ever seen a peregrine falcon? Are they as fast as I've heard? Yes, yes. They, they can dive. They, they say, you know, I don't know, 150 to 200 <laughs> miles an hour in their dive. But they, yeah, they're, they're fast. Uh, it's, it's mostly what, when they're kind of in a dive. But um, yeah, no, they're, they're uh, actually, you know, you can see them in downtown Detroit or at the Detroit Zoo. There's some on the tower there nesting. Uh, I know that there's one on the city county building in downtown Mount, uh, Mount Clemens. And there used to be one on the old AT&T microwave tower in downtown Pontiac. Is it true all young fledglings are fed insects for protein? Um, I'd say, you know, that, that might be largely true, but I'm sure there's exceptions to that. Um, just, uh, you know, as I said, there's, there's some birds are, um, yeah, I mean, some birds are ready to go. Like they're called precocial birds. So some of your, like, you know, your sandhill cranes, your ducks, uh, your pheasants, um, some of your game birds are, are what we call precocial, meaning that when they hatch, those birds can walk around right away and their eyes are open and they're all fuzzy. <laughs> and, um, and those kind of birds that are ready to go, they might start eating grain, you know, right away. I mean, they don't have to have is, you know, but, but your other birds, like your song birds are mostly what we call altricial birds and they're born more helpless. They're born without feathers. Um, their eyes are swollen shut when they first emerge from the egg. So they, they're going to need a tremendous amount of parental care and they're going to pretty much rely on insects those type of birds. Can you re uh, recommend any local places to see raptors in captivity, like a rehab or a wildlife park? Well, well Hawkfest had, had some caged raptors. They've, actually, some are brought in and some of them are there all the time down at the Nature Center at Erie Metro Park. There's, they've got a caged bald eagle that kind of lives there, <laughs> um, down there. But at Hawkfest, which is in September, um, they'll have a number of um, captive raptors that they bring in. They used to have a couple of hawks behind Cran the Cranbrook Nature Center. And I know that they had one over at the uh, Stony Creek Nature Center uh, in an outbuilding there. Oh, someone looked it up on uh, Google Ducks Can Dive 20 to 30 feet. Wow. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I, I think um, we're went through them all. And um, we want to thank you again for the presentation. Oh, someone said today is National Bird Day. So that's cool. Um, I also wanted to remind you that in June, um, we have another Zoom program on gardening for birds, strategies for optimizing habitat. So if you enjoy birds, that might be something that you might be interested in. So um, anything else you want to add, um, 
my bird guys. <laughs> I'd just like to thank all the people that tuned in tonight. Uh, it was wonderful to have you here and uh, we hope you had fun and maybe garnered a few uh, morsels of information you can use going forward. Thanks, thanks so much for, for joining. We, we, All right, we, thanks again. And there'll be a survey to fill out. Um, if you could do that, that helps us when we try to get other programs for you. Thanks again, everyone. And thanks, have a great night.